So last week we went through 1 Kings 13 and 14, and the two things that we learned was the, the, the nation has been split in half, and we learned that in the north, the northern region of Israel, what was collective Israel under David and Solomon, has now been split in two. The north has a new king, his name is Jeroboam, and they immediately, from day one, went to idolatry. They started setting up pagan altars and worshiping false gods and changing the festival calendar and anointing priests who had no connection to the Levitical priesthood. Day one, that's what Jeroboam was doing. In the south, it took a little bit longer, but eventually in the south under Judah, they turned to idolatry as well. And that's kind of where we pick up the story today. And the questions that we're gonna ask ourselves that the author wants us to consider is what happens now that the north and the south have both turned to idolatry? What happens when you give yourselves over to idolatry? What happens when you give yourselves over to the ideological worldviews of this world? The promises that come from worshiping pagan gods are that the rain's gonna come, you're gonna have better crops, you're gonna have a more fruitful life. Things are gonna be better if you just bow down and worship this God. The question that 15 and 16 asks is, is that true? What happens when both nations, north and south, give themselves over to the temptations of the world, allow the world to inform and shape their worldview? What happens when the ideologies of the world seep into God's people and start shifting and changing the clear commands that God has given them through his word? What happens? Does life actually get better if we do things the way the world invites us to, or do things get worse? That's what the author wants you wrestling with today. We are full on into idolatry in the north and the south, and the author wants you to see what happens when the people of a nation completely give themselves over to things that are anti-God. What happens? Let's pick up the story in 1 Kings chapter 15. And we're gonna start reading in verse one. It says, in the 18th year of King Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, Abiam began to reign over Judah. He reigned for three years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Maaka, the daughter of Abishalom. And he walked in all the sins that his father did before him, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father. Nevertheless, for David's sake, the Lord his God gave him a lamp in Jerusalem, setting up his son after him and establishing Jerusalem. But David did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Excuse me, because David did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and did not turn aside from anything that he commanded all the days of his life except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. And there was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam. That, those, that's the house of Rehoboam, the house of Jeroboam, all the days of his life. And the rest of the acts of Abiam and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah? And there was war between Abiam and Jeroboam, and Abiam slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the city of David, and Asa his son reigned in his place. Let's pause there. So in 1 Kings 15, we pick up the story in the south, which is a little confusing because the author is trying to let us know what is happening in the north while he's describing the south. And you're gonna find this pattern as we go through Kings, and you'll also find it as you study the book of the 12 and the minor prophets. There's this pivot, let's look at the north, let's look at the south, let's look at the north, let's look at the south, and it goes back and forth. There's this volley until the north is completely wiped out and there's only the south. The author is doing that in 1 Kings 15, and he's saying, while Jeroboam is ruling in the north, let's zoom in on the south and see what's happening with Rehoboam. And what we find is that Rehoboam has died, he died at the end of 14, and his son, Abiam, has took over. Now in Chronicles, this guy's name is Abiah. It's the same guy though, Abiam, Abiah. 
But Kings calls him Abiam, so we'll stick with that. And we're told that Abiam rules for three years, and we're told that he's just as wicked as Rehoboam, his father, and Solomon, his grandfather. And then we're told why he's just as wicked. In verse 3, we're told that he was wicked because he was holy, he was not wholly true to the Lord his God. And so what we find here, the author is trying to just crack the door a little bit, so a light, little bit of light starts shining through, and you're cu- hopefully you're curious enough to open that door. What's going on behind this door? What you're going to find behind that door is now three generations of men who are walking in wickedness. And the wickedness that the Bible is describing is this wickedness that is described most accurately as not being wholly true to the word, to the Lord. And that word wholly true is a Hebrew word, and the word is salem, and it means untouched, complete, or undivided. The reason why these guys were described as not walking like David, but walking in sin was because their heart wasn't untouched. It wasn't undivided. It was divided. It was touched by something. These guys lived compromised lives. Their hearts were not wholly devoted to the Lord. Their hearts were spread thin across devoting their hearts to many different things. And then we're brought in uh, in verse 5, or four, 4 and 5, the contrast of David's heart. Here is a guy who's in the same family line whose heart was wholly devoted to the Lord. So what is the author trying to show us when you've got a guy who's wholly devoted to the Lord and then three generations of guys whose heart is not wholly devoted to the Lord? And why is God allowing three generations of kings to rule and they're not wholly devoted to the Lord? Why isn't God intervening? Why isn't he stepping in? Why isn't he putting an end to this mess? Well, we're told because of this guy named David. His heart was so wholly devoted to the Lord that God kept a covenant promise to him even in the midst of the three men who came out from his lineage who had no regard for the Lord. But what the author wants you to wrestle with is this lineage, this family line, what's going on with these men. He wants you to start drawing an interesting connection between heart posture and family lineage. That's the reason why all these men are described as wicked because they're not wholly devoted to the Lord. So the heart is something we should be looking at. And then we're talking about family lineage. Now we've got this guy and this guy's son and this guy's son and this guy's great grandfather. How, how are these things, two, two things connected? The author wants you considering that there is in some way a line that you can draw between the posture of a father's heart and how his son is going to turn out. He wants you to see this clear, that a father's heart in some way, his posture, what he values, what he thinks is important, in some way guides how a son is going to grow up. Now that's good news and that's bad news. Because a heart that is wholly devoted to the Lord communicates things that are devoted to the Lord and hopefully what that does is it teaches the son to value those same things. And we see that at the very beginning of Solomon's life. One of the first things Solomon wanted to do was honor the request of his dying father to build that temple. He did that because that was in David's heart. David valued that and therefore Solomon valued that. But once David was gone, Solomon started making accommodations for these foreign women and his heart wandered from what David taught him. But in some ways, what Solomon acted out is also directly connected to the way that David acted with women. And so you see it play when Solomon dies, Rehoboam rises up and what did Rehoboam see his father do? He watched him be a hard man. He built the temple and the royal complex with slave labor. And what was the first thing Rehoboam did when he stood up and the people cried out, please, will you, will you, will you like go lighter on us? Just, just chill out a little bit. His, his response is, no, I'm going to be even harder than my father was. He watched what his father taught and he amplified it up for the next generation. And now we're told that his son Abiam, it's even worse. Every person is responsible for making their own personal choices. And there is good news that the cycle can be broken. That if you're sitting in this place and you're like, man, I had a pretty lousy father, that's not the end of your story. 
You don't have to be a lousy father. You can take what was taught and say, that taught me what not to do. And so I'm going to do the opposite. And it can bless you because now you have been taught in a way not to walk. In the same way that a good godly father can be a blessing to you because he taught you in the way that you can walk. But it's also not this big broad thing where we can all just say, well, like my dad was a good guy and so everything he did, therefore I'm going to do. No, you have to get down at some granular level and say, this man walked with character, but he had no restraint when it came to money. And so I'm going to walk with integrity of heart. This man loved the word of God. I watched him pray constantly, but he could not get a hold of his credit cards. And so I'm not going to walk in that way. And so rather than just saying as a blanket statement, righteous dad, righteous son, unrighteous dad, unrighteous son. There is a pattern that the author wants you to rest, wrestle with, that, that there really is this sense that a, there is a cycle, that there is a thing that can be passed down from father to son, but it's not a sure bet. It can be broken because the son can take the teachings and do something different with it. And that's the good news because the cycle is going to be broken when Asa is born. You've got three generations of wicked kings who were not holy to the Lord. And then Asa is born and he looks at his dad and his grandpa and his great grandpa. And he's like, things aren't going very well. I'm putting into practice everything I've been taught. And I'm seeing that trajectory isn't great. Things are lousy. And I think it's because of the decisions that they've made. So I'm going to change course. Things can change, but you cannot erase the very true reality that there is a connection to the way that your heart posture is as a father and the way that you teach your kids. What you think is important, your kids will think is important. Now we're going to see the cycle broken, pick up in 1 Kings 15 verse 9. In the 20th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, Asa began to reign over Judah. And he reigned for 41 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Maacah, the daughter of Abi Shalom. Now that is the exact same description as verse two. And it would seem that Abiam and Asa were brothers because they had the same mother. But here's the thing, in Hebrew, there's no word for grandmother. So what he's describing here is that Asa was his dad, or excuse me, Ab Abiam was his father. Abiam had a son named Asa, and they're describing that they both had the same mom, but, but this lady's name, Maacah, the daughter of Abishalom, this is his grandmother, and we find that out in 2 Chronicles 14, 1. 11, it says, Asa did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and David, uh, as David his father had done. Okay, we're, we're, on a, we're on the right road. This is good. This is good news. Asa finally is shining light and he's, he's walking in the way that David did, not in the way that his, his father did. And what is the first thing he did? Verse 12, he put away the male cult prostitutes out of the land to remove all the idols that his father has made. That's great. If you, if you take the throne, first thing you got to do, day one, get rid of those male prostitutes. Okay? That's just... That's baseline, okay? Day one, no more male prostitutes. It's important. Verse 13, he also removed, Ma he also removed Maaka, his mother, from being queen mother because she had made an abominable image of Asherah, and Asa cut down her image and burned it in the, book, the brook Kidron. All right, so he's, he's taking the titles away from grandma. That's also good. But the high places were not taken away. So he went 90%. But the Bible says, nevertheless, the heart of Asa was wholly true to the Lord all his days. And he brought into the house of the Lord the sacred gifts of his father and his own sacred gifts of silver and gold and vessels. And there was war between Asa and Baasha, king of Israel, all the days. Wait, okay, okay, so now we're confused. We're still tracking in Judah. And we find that Abiam has died and his son Asa has taken over. And we find that Asa, his son, that's referenced, uh, just as I said, is 2 Chronicles 14, 1. And we're told that Asa is wholly devoted to the Lord. He's bringing religious reforms. He's, he's uh, firing his grandma from the wicked uh, role that she has given herself as queen mother. And then verse 16 pops up. And we're told that Baasha is king over Israel. Now, where did Baasha come from? I thought Jeroboam was king of Israel. This is one of the reasons why it can be difficult to read Kings, and while, while you're doing your Bible reading plan, you're snoozing when these happens, because you're like, I don't know, I cannot follow these names. I don't, 
I wasn't even really paying attention. It didn't even dawn on me that Basha and Jeroboam were not the same. I, I'm, not, I'm not visualizing this. But the last thing we were told was there was a war against Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Remember that? And now Asa is king, and we're told that he's fighting Baasha. Who is Baasha? What happened to Jeroboam? Remember me telling you that there's this volley of the story? We're going to focus in on Judah, then we're going to focus in on Israel. The author will get back to that, and he will tell us where Baasha came from, but there's one issue we have to address first. The issue start comes in 17 through 24, and it focuses in on Asa and this war that he has with Baasha. So just put a pin in the fact that you don't know where Baasha came from, and let's figure out what's going on. What is this war? What's happening? Pick it up in verse 17. It says, Baasha, king of Israel, he went up against Judah and built Ramah, that he might permit no one to go out or come home into Asa, king of Judah. Then Asa took all the silver and the gold that was left in the treasury of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house, and he gave them into the hands of his servants. And King Asa sent them to Ben-Hadad, the son of Tabrimon, the son of Hetzion, the king of Syria, who lived in Damascus, saying, let there be a covenant between me and you, as there was between my father and your father. Behold, I'm sending you a present of silver and gold. Go break your covenant with Baasha, king of Israel, that he may withdraw from me. Then Ben-Hadad listened to King Asa and sent the commanders of his armies against the cities of Israel and conquered Ejon, Dan, Abel, Beth, Maaka, and Chinneroth with all the land of Naphtali. And when Baasha heard of it, he stopped building Ramah and he went and lived in Tizrah, excuse me, Tirzah. Then King Asa made a proclamation to all Judah, and none was exempt, and they carried away the stones of Ramah and its timber, with which Baasha had been building. And with them King Asa built Geba of Benjamin and Mizpah. Now the rest of all the acts of Asa and all his might and all that he did in the cities that he built, are they not written in the book of Chronicles of the kings of Judah? But in his old age, he was diseased in his feet. Okay, that's weird. Verse 24, and Asa slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David, his father. And Jehoshaphat, his son, reigned in his place. Okay, now let's pause. So Bahasha is king over Israel in the north, and Asa is king over Judah in the south. So we've got some war going on between the south and the north. And what we find out is that the king of the north, Baasha, he starts plunging into territory that is controlled by Judah in order to build a stronghold against Judah so that the people of Israel will never go back down to Judah and worship at the temple. So that there's some clarity and some visualization. I want to show you this map. This is a rough understanding of the territory that the northern kingdom of Israel controlled uh, under Baasha. And the green, the bottom there, that's the region of Judah that Asa controlled at this time. Now what happened was, Asa is ruling here in Jerusalem, and the king of the north, Baasha, lives in Terzah. He says, I want to make sure that nobody from the north goes down and worships in the south, so I'm going to basically bust through the line here on the, the border, and I, uh, there's this one city called Ramah, and I'm going to build a stronghold in the region of Judah, because that's the territory where people cross through. If you want to go down to the temple for worship, the town you got to go through is Ramah. So I'm going to build up a stronghold there. And what Asa, king of Judah, decides to do is he takes a bunch of money from the treasury, and he goes and he hires the king of Syria. Syria is way up there where those speakers are, all right? It's off the map. And the king of Syria takes the king of Judah's money, forms an army, breaks the alliance he previously had with Israel and Baasha, and goes and starts picking away at northern cities. He takes Ejon, he takes Dan, he takes, he takes uh, Abel Beth Maaka, and he starts fortifying most of the northern tribe of Naphtali in Israel. 
Well, at this point, Baasha, who is in Ramah, building a stronghold against Judah, finds out that Syria has now started attacking the north, and he's like, all right, guys, we gotta abandon this plan and go defend our land in the north. So all of the armies of Israel that were building the fortified city in Ramah, they flee and head back up north, and on the way, the king stops in Terza and sends his military guys up to fight the battle, and he just stays home. At this point, Asa goes back up to Ramah. It's only about a five mile uh, distance. King Asa goes up to Ramah and he brings a bunch of guys with him and they dismantle the fortified cities and they build up two other cities who are just flanking Ramah on either side. So that's essentially what this story is. Now, the question is, why is this so important? Because this story is told in such a way to lead us to believe that that's kind of the end of the story. But there's more to the story, and we're told that because we're supposed to go read Chronicles. The question you should be asking yourself is, Asa has, we've been told, he's wholly devoted to the Lord. All right, good, so his heart's wholly devoted to the Lord. But why is it that the moment the enemy starts creeping in on his territory, his first temptation is to go hire a foreign king, make a covenant with a foreign pagan king, and ask him to fight his battles for him. I want you to turn your Bibles to 2 Chronicles 6, 16, 7 through 12. I just want to read this section of how the author of Chronicles describes this exact same situation. We're told that a prophet comes to Asa after this entire situation. This is 2 Chronicles 16, 7. It says, at that time, Hanani the seer came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, because you have relied on the king of Syria and did not rely on the Lord your God, the army of the king of Syria has escaped you. Were not the Ethiopians and the Libyans a huge army with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because of you relied on the Lord, he gave them into your hand. So he's referencing previous armies where Asa trusted the Lord and the Lord dealt with the battle for him. He says, verse 9, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless toward him. You have done foolishly in this, for from now on you will have wars. And Asa was angry with the seer, and he put him in the stocks in prison, for he was in a rage with him because of this. And Asa inflicted cruelties upon some of the people at the time. And the acts of Asa from the last, from the first to the last, are written in the books of kings of Judah and Israel. And in the 39th year of his reign, Asa was diseased in his feet, and his disease became very severe, yet even in his disease, he did not seek the Lord, but sought help from physicians. What is going on? How is it that we can be told in 1 Kings fifteen fourteen that Asa was wholly devoted to the Lord? And then we're told in 2 Chronicles 16 and 7 and 12 that he did not consult this Lord that he was wholly devoted to in times of trouble. How do we reconcile these? Well, I would argue that the way we reconcile these is to look at our own lives. Because Asa was a normal man, just like you and me. And what the Bible is describing here is the kind of man that we can be sometimes. The, the kind of man that two things at the same time can be true. We can be wholly devoted to the Lord in our heart, but our mind can be way too practical for our own good. You really are truly devoted to the Lord. You want the best. You want God in your life. But the problem is that in most situations when you're confronted with trouble, logic overrides faith and you try to reason your way through trials. You don't trust, you don't wait. And that's one of the things you're gonna pick up in 1 Kings, that trusting and waiting are synonymous. The people of God need to view trusting the Lord and waiting on the Lord as synonymous things. They're the same. And so what happens is, in your heart devotion, I really am devoted to the Lord, you struggle in your brain because you're too logical for your own good. You are prone, when confronted with an enemy king coming your way, to make a checklist. 
of what's good, what's bad, and what, what like this, tr- this decision over here, and I've got this other decision, I've got to make one or two, and so I'm just going to, what are the pros and cons in each column, and at the end of the day, I'm just going to be logical about this, and I'm going to make the most wise decision, because God gave me logic, and he gave me this brain, and he wants me to reason my way out of this situation, and the word of God smacks you in the face with that, because that's not how people of faith make decisions. This isn't to to cut the knees out from logic. There is some level of just logic in, in the world we live in today. It's kind of gone out the window. There doesn't seem to be any logic anymore. So there is some value in the people of God having logic, but logic cannot be in front of faith. We are not people of logic. We are people of faith. We trust the Lord. We don't trust reason. And the reason why is because the Lord does not use the wisdom of this world. He uses the wisdom of heaven to confound the wisdom of this world. And so a lot of times when you look at a situation from all intents and purposes, it seems like logically this is the conclusion you should come to. But the question the Bible wants you to ask is, have you prayed about it first? Is your first reaction to solve the problem or is your first reaction to fall on your knees and ask the Lord to solve the problem or give you right perspective? This is the indictment against Asa. And this is what's happening in Judah. He is removing all of the false worship, all of the idols. That's great, that's good news. But there's another issue that's going on in Judah that happens in our lives a lot too where we're proactive about getting rid of all the, the spiritual stuff and the, I don't want to bow down, I don't want to, I don't want to make a covenant with my eyes, I don't want to do this, I don't want to be, behold these kind of things. That's all really good. But the question is, what do you do and how do you function when you're at work? Are you a person of faith at home and on Sunday morning, but a person of logic at work? Do you bring your faith to work? Do you reconcile things by trusting and waiting and watching God to move? Or are you convinced that what you need to do is get your hands on that steering wheel and make things happen in God's name? All right, let's get back to the text. What we find at the end of 15, and this is 25 through 32, I'm just gonna summarize this. The attention shifts, and we find out where Baasha came from. So now, we were in the south, and the author helps us understand what the issues in the south are. Now we're gonna go up to the north, and there's a whole different set of issues in the north. Amen? I missed the joke, but it's okay. So we're going up into the north, and what's happening in the north is that Jeroboam had a son. This is what we're told in 25 through 32. Jeroboam had a son, his name was Nadab, and he was so wicked that he only ruled for two years, and God raised up a man to kill Jeroboam's son because God has had enough of Jeroboam and his lineage. So after two years, Nadab is murdered by this guy named Baasha, and Baasha is now the king over Israel, and that's where Baasha came from. So let's pick up the story in uh, 33, 15, 32, 3, and then read a little bit into 16. So in the third year of Asa, king of Judah, so this is the pivot from the south back up to the north. We're in the north. Baasha, the son of Ahiah, began to reign over all Israel at Terzah. And he reigned 24 years. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of Jeroboam and in his sin, which he had made Israel to sin. And the word of the Lord came to Jehu, the son of Hanani, against Baasha, saying, since I exalted you out of the dust and made you a leader over my people Israel, and you have walked in the way of Jeroboam and have made, people, made my people Israel to sin, provoking me to anger with their sins, behold, I will utterly sweep away Baasha and his house, and I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. So the guy that you just took out, uh, your family is going to suffer the same consequences. Anyone, verse 4, belonging to Baasha who dies in the city, the dogs shall eat. And anyone who dies in the field, the birds of the heaven shall eat. Now the rest of the acts of Baasha and what he did and his might, are they not written in the book of Chronicles, the kings of Israel? And Baasha slept with his fathers and was buried at Terzah. And Elah, his son, reigned in his place. Moreover, the word of the Lord came for the prophet Jehu, the son of Hanani, against Baasha and his house. 
both because of the evil that he did in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger, the work of his hands, and in being in the house of Jeroboam, and also because he destroyed it. So God raises up this guy named Baasha to judge the house of Jeroboam, and then we find out that Baasha's house is just as wicked as Jeroboam's. You remember the question that we asked when we started this today? What happens when you, the nation just gives themselves over to sin? When everyone in the nation just decides, all right, we're not gonna do what God has commanded us to do, we're gonna do what we think is best. What happens? The nation spirals into utter chaos. That's what happens. You got king taking out king, taking out king, and that's what happens in the north. This is what I'm gonna summarize. You've got verses eight through about 29. You've got king after king after king murdered. One guy rises up, another guy takes him out. and He rules for a little while and then somebody else stands up. I wanna give you a sense of scale for this. If you'll put that slide up of the timeline. This is a truncated version of the slide that I made. So when I told you earlier that I would share that with you afterwards, this is just the first little half of that. But I want you to get a sense for what's going on in the south and what's going on in the north. You got Saul, then David, then Solomon, and after Solomon, the kingdom splits. Rehoboam's in the south, Jeroboam's in the north. Rehoboam's a wicked king. He gives birth to another wicked king, Abiam. And then Asa pops up. And Asa rules for over 40 years. And you can see that there's no other kings in the south. While Asa is ruling in the south, look at what's going on in the north. Jeroboam's got a wicked son named Nadab. God raised up Baasha to kill Nadab. Baasha's a wicked king, and God commands judgment over him. He has a son named Elah, and Elah is a wicked king. And while he's out fighting a battle one day, one of his uh, court officials named Zimri decides that he wants the throne, so he kills Elah. And Zimri, he throws a party for himself that lasts almost seven days, and while he's drunk in his castle, the commander of Elah's army, Omri, comes in and kills Zimri. After seven days, the dude only ruled seven days. Omri comes in and says, I'm king. But this other guy named Tibni, he says, no, 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 I'm king. And they duke it out for about a year until Omri's like, I've had enough. And he just kills Tibni. And then Omri becomes king. And then we're told that Omri has this son named Ahab. And it's that Ahab we've all heard of, the guy who married Jezebel. But I put this up there because I want you to get a sense of the nonsense and the mayhem and the chaos going on up in the north. One of the things that Omri does besides have a son named Ahab is he moves the kingdom to Samaria and that's where the kingdom is until Israel falls. So just have in your mind a sense of scale for what's going on in the north. What happens when a people give themselves over to sin it spirals into utter chaos. When you proclaim in the land that whoever has the biggest sword gets to rule, somebody is always gonna show up at your door with a bigger sword. And that's what happens. Now I want you to pick up the story at the, like towards the end of 16 and verse 29. This is how the chapter closes. In the 38th year of Asa king of Judah, So while Asa is still ruling in the south, Ahab, the son of Omri, begins to rule over Israel in the north. Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. That's saying a lot. It was as if he had, excuse me, it was as as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. For he took his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshiped him. He erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria, and Ahab had an Asherah, And Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. And in his days, so while Ahab is ruling and being wicked, Hiel of Bethel built Jericho. 
He laid its foundation at the cost of Abarim, his firstborn, and set up its gates at the cost of his youngest son, Sagub, according to the, Lord, the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Joshua, the son of Nun. Now, if you remember all the way back in your Bible reading plan to Joshua, when Joshua came in and completely sacked Jericho, it was commanded that that city would never be rebuilt again because it was cursed. And what happens to the man who tries to rebuild the city? He loses two of his sons in the process. But I wanna back up a little bit because what we're finding in the north is very interesting. Ahab is described as the worst king Israel has ever had, and he's described as not only walking in the way of Jeroboam, which means pagan worship festivals and anointing new uh, priests and uh, setting up uh, different customs for worship, but we're also told that he marries this woman named Jezebel, who becomes a very popular character. In fact, John the Revelator references her in one of the books to Revelation. We'll talk more about that last, next week. But the question is that it seems like one of the great offenses that's going on in the north of Ahab is not just the spiral of sin that starts with a couple of Shearim poles and starts with changing the festivals, but it ends with marrying this woman named Jezebel who's a Baal worshiper and bringing Baal worship into Israel. What is the deal with Baal? Who is this dude? Why is Baal such a big deal? Well, Baal was a Canaanite god. But he wasn't the chief Canaanite god. The Canaanites had a pantheon of gods. They believed in lots of different gods, but there was one father god over all of their pantheon, and his name was El. And in Canaanite mythology, El had a son, and the son's name was Baal. And Baal means Lord. So I just want you for a moment put together what is happening in northern Israel? King Ahab has married a woman that has brought in false gods, and in their mythology, what they're worshiping is the son of God who is referred to as Lord. Can you see how offensive that would be to Yahweh, whose redemptive plan for the nations is to send his only son who should be the Lord of all the nations, before the plan ever set up, before, well, not before it was set up, before the plan uh, came into fruition, there was prophecies that this was going to happen. And you already see the enemy trying to counterfeit this. And you see the people of God worshiping it. This is the great offense. It's not just setting up some Asherah pole. It's not just some sexual worship practices. It's the fact that who you're worshiping is setting themselves up against God Almighty and his plan of redemption for the entire nations. This leads us back to the original question. I started today asking, what is the fruit of idolatry? What happens when we give ourselves over to pagan ideology? What does it produce? And the answer after two chapters in the north and the south is it always produces the same thing. Calamity, and chaos and mayhem. It is not a new thing for the world to offer their wisdom in solving problems. The modern way we solve problems is to let's connect more people and do it through social media. The modern way of solving problems is if there is an issue, let's medicate it so it stops becoming an issue. The modern way of solving problems is to indoctrinate the people so they all think the same way, and we do that through a little device like this, where algorithms control what we see and reinforce what we think. It is not a new idea for the world to perpetuate its wisdom using the technological advances of the day. This was happening in ancient Israel and ancient Judah, and it's happening today. And the question the author wants us to consider is it doesn't matter what time period you live in, it doesn't matter how much technology you have or how smart you think you are, the offer is still the same. There is the wisdom from on high and you do things his way, and there is the wisdom of this world and you do things that way. And both of these systems, they cannot mix together. They are polar opposites. 
And so the question is, when the world comes knocking and saying, oh, you've got a problem with parenting, you've got a problem with school system, you've got a, you've got a problem with uh, anxiety, you've got, a, you've got a problem with this, you've got a problem with that, we have a solution for that. The question the author of 1 Kings 15, 16 wants you to ask is, what is the fruit of that? If you buy in to what they're selling, look down the road 10 years and ask yourself, is it really working? We have been sold things. I remember as a kid being told uh, through commercials on television uh, that what we were doing as humans was killing the rainforest. We were cutting down way too many trees and the best thing that you could do would be to switch to plastic. You remember? Well, guess what? We're 30 years later, 35 years later, and now we're being forced to drink out of paper straws because we've gone full, full circle, right? It doesn't matter what the world tries to tell us. Here's the problem. We can solve worldly problems with worldly solutions. The Bible is clear that the only thing that worldly solutions bring is more worldly problems. You are not going to get out of the mess that you're in right now using the ways that the world has sold to you as how you're going to get out of it. Because all it does is create more problems down the road that they can then sell you a pill to fix. That's the world's system. It's self-perpetuating, it's self-sustaining, and all it does is teach you to stay into the system of this world and dependent on the system of this world so that you can never truly live free because you're a slave to the systems of this world. Now look, at this point you're like, I think this sermon would go better if you were wearing a tinfoil hat on your head because you sound like a crazy nutty. But when the Word of God presents to you all the way back 4,000 years ago, here's the way things work. And then you jump forward another 1,000 years and you still see it working the same way. And you jump thousand, another 2,000, you still seeing it work the same way. Maybe we aren't the people who are crazy. Maybe the truth is that when you give yourselves as a nation over to sin, the only thing you're going to get is more sin. You're going to, idol worship spirals into worse idol worship. It does not get you out of the mess. It does not bring joy. It does not bring peace. It does not bring rest. It does not deliver contentment. It only brings more and more despair that then they have to come up with a new way to treat the despair. Wisdom of this world never makes the world a better place. It says things like, if you buy this expensive thing and you save up for it, your life is gonna be better and everyone's gonna like you. And then you get the thing and guess what? They've come out with a new model and now you gotta sell the old thing and buy the new thing. The wisdom of this world tells you idolize this person Become like this person. Look at the way they talk. Look at the way they dress. And then you get close to this person and you realize it's all a facade. This person's worse off than you are. They're a garbage person. The wisdom of this world works in, in such a way where you're told, uh, as a society, we have to accommodate this one group, right? And it tugs on our heartstrings, and it seems right because we come from a kingdom who doesn't, we, we, we don't like the disenfranchised. We don't like the fact that, that this world takes advantage of women and children. And so Christ comes, and he brings this new message that everybody in Christ is one, that there is no more slave or free or Greek or Jew. Everybody comes to the table. And so we're sold as a people of God. Get behind this thing. Let's accommodate this group. And the moment we do it, all of a sudden, well, if you made an accommodation for this group, then you got to make one for this group, and then you got to make one for this group. And all of a sudden, the, the, what we've been commanded to do has been eroded because all we're doing now is just making accommodations for every special little group. That's the wisdom of this world. The wisdom of this world looks like technical, technological advancements, like the internet. It is, the, the internet is a pretty amazing thing. I was, I was alive before it showed up, and now that it's around, it's pretty wild. This AI thing, kind of, that's pretty wild, okay? But what do, what do most people use it for? Pornography. Selling and trading people, hiding wealth through crypto. It's used for nefarious purposes. You've got widespread financial prosperity and wealth. 
And what is it used for? It's used on an increasing level every day for more slavery and manipulation, the same thing that was used for thousands of years ago. But now it's not just for people who have it. Now everybody has a little bit of taste of it. But this is the thing about this text. We know this about the world. This isn't new. Of course the world is gonna act this way and, and live this way. This isn't surprising. The world is gonna do this because God has disinherited them and they're gonna go make their own sins and, and, and they're filled with sin. They're gonna make their decisions based off of sin. That's not new. But then we start understanding, well, God desired to save the nations and so how was he gonna do it? He was gonna raise up a people called Israel and Israel was going to steward the plan of the better way. God gave Israel the law, the instructions, and said, the nations are doing things this way. Here's the right way to be a human. Do this. And the message, according to Israel, they were supposed to steward this, live this way, and be a light among the Gentiles. So the Gentiles would see how foolish and spiral their sin would get them and turn to the light and say, I don't want to live as a slave anymore. I want to be free and worship your God, not the gods of the nations. But then something happened. Israel, who was supposed to be a steward, they were elect, they were chosen to steward this message, did not obey the message. They instead traded the message and wanted the nations. They gave themselves over to the same gods that the nations were worshiping. And so what happens when you get to a place when God's people trade in God's instructions for worldliness, well, you get 1 Kings 15 and 16. You get calamity and chaos and mayhem. And so my argument today is that the purpose of these chapters is to make us weep. You should read this and weep. You shouldn't read this and think, oh, foolish Israel. How dumb can you be? No, you should read this and weep because we are at risk of repeating the same mistakes today. Because the church was given instructions called the good news. And we were told as God's people to steward this message and live it out among the nations and call the nations to turn from their pagan worship and turn to the one true loving Christ who is the light of the world. We were meant to steward the message, be a city on a hill and be the one sane people in all of society who are living blessed lives that are enticing for the nations to turn their back on wickedness and turn to righteousness. But in the same way that Israel fell victim, we are running the risk of falling victim. We run the risk of falling victim like Israel, who turned to the nations for guidance. Lord, how are we going to build a church? Surely the organizations of this world have some leadership tips to teach us. Surely the business the organizational structure of this world. Maybe we should send our pastors to business school so they can learn a thing or two about growing and scaling a business. We go to the wisdom of this world. Pastors, they don't go to the word of God to find what it says to God's people. They look on the New York Times bestseller list, they pick a book and they just preach through whatever is the most popular book. But it's not just like Israel. We're not, we won't, we're not just prey to falling into the same temptations of Israel. We, pray, we fall prey to the same temptations of Judah. The idea that we can be wholly devoted as a people, but too logical for our own good. That's one of the big issues, right? You're either so pagan that you've let the world into your church service and non-believers are now dictating how we worship, or you're so wholly devoted to the Lord but you're so earthly minded that you don't walk in faith, you, work, you walk in logic. Or the other thing that this chapter brings up is the temptation to go back in and rebuild old cursed places like Jericho. Instead of living like Israel and Judah, we're like Hael who are going to rebuild some ancient foundations that God said, don't do that anymore. Ah, well, it's been enough time, maybe we should revisit. That might be a thing worth rebuilding. 
and we do it at the state. Uh, we do it at the sake for for the sake of uh, we we do it uh, at the uh, expense of our children of the next generation. God said, "Don't go there. Don't do that. Don't rebuild that. Well, let's redo it. Let's try it. Let's that old way. Let's try it one more time." And who suffers? Our kids. So, these two chapters. They stand like a warning and a call to repentance. They're a warning so that the people of God don't walk down the path that the people of God have walked down in the past. Don't do it. Don't trust the wisdom of this world. It only leads to more chaos and sin. If you think your life is a mess now, follow the systems of this world. It's going to be even worse. That's one warning. The other warning is don't, don't, don't be a people who have forsaken faith because you want to do the right thing or the logical thing. Sometimes following God is completely illogical. It doesn't make sense, but you've got to trust. So this is a warning. Don't rebuild ancient things. Don't trust the systems of this world. But it's also called repentance because some of us, we've already given ourselves to this. As you're sitting here, there is a, uh, it feels like a little prick, like a, like a little, um, like a knot in your stomach. You can hear the Holy Spirit speaking to you. You have been guilty of this. Dad, you have not shown your son the right way to live. He's watching you model a heart that is not wholly devoted. You're devoted to the Lord, but your heart is also devoted to this other thing. And so it, it's a call to repentance. It's a warning. It's a call to repentance. But the last thing that is, is I'll get into 17. I can't go there because I get over there next week. But the last thing it is, is it's a call for the prophets to rise up. Because guess what happens in the midst of all this nonsense? Ahab, Jezebel, a line of filthy kings. There's wickedness everywhere. What's chapter 17? The very first verse. Now Elijah the Tishbite of Gilead said to Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, before I stand here, there will be neither rain nor uh, clouds for three years except by my word. Oh, man. So it's bad news because you've got to turn and repent. But the moment you turn to repent, it's good news because the prophets start rising up. And I told you who the prophets are last week, right? The prophetic voice of the Lord speaks to the church. Who is the ones who are stewarding God's word? It's the church. And if the church would stop trying to get the world to like them and be on some political spectrum or let the nation start telling us how we're going to worship on Sunday morning, if we, would, if we just reject that and just stick to what he has taught us and live it out and project to the nations, city on a hill, light in the darkness, we would start becoming a prophetic voice that speaks the truth to a nation and a people who don't know what truth is. Now, the moment I said that, this is when I close, the moment I said that, I know what you're thinking. All right, I just got licensed to start posting some political content on Facebook. Thank you, Lord. That's what I was looking for. I just wanted my pastor to tell me it was okay. No, 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 you've already lost it. Don't do that. Because you're not going to take on Washington. But how about that street you live on? How about those kids that live in your house? How about those three people that work with you at work. How about you be a prophetic voice that models the instructions of what it looks like to truly live a godly life and let God work through you in that rather than standing in a dark hallway and shouting at the top of your lungs what you think is right because it's logical because that's what everybody else does and you run the risk of eroding your testimony in the process because the people who live next to you want nothing to do with what you say because you're shouting at people you'll never meet online. Best advice for you, go ahead and just shut it down. If all you do is keep social media so you can see pictures of your grandkids, use text messaging. Look, I'm not commanding you to do anything. You do, you're gonna stand before holy God and give an account for what you do, but a lot of you are gonna, there's gonna be a lot of weeping and gnashing of teeth one day when you stand before a holy God. And he says, why did you post that kind of stuff? 
Don't you know that your neighbor was following you and it eroded your ability to speak the truth I wanted you to speak at a dinner table when you invited them over and served them a meal and shared the good news of Christ. They couldn't hear it because of all your rhetoric online. Folks, the best thing you can do is be a prophetic voice by dialing back all the nonsense and being caught up in the world systems and be true to the word of God. And that comes by being true to the word of God to those who are closest to you first. Amen? All right, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we come before you and we say thank you. Thank you for the warning. Thank you for the call to repentance. And thank you for the expectation that's being built in our heart for being a true prophetic voice in the midst of a dark world. We ask you to send us out of this place with boldness, with strength, with courage, but above all, ears to hear and eyes to see. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Amen.